In 1964, Granada Television brought together a group of seven-year-olds. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. We have followed their lives every seven years. I don't want to keep still. It's life, you know. Don't wait for nobody. They talked about their dreams. If I could have two girls and two boys. Their ambitions. I'd quite like to get into politics. And their fears for the future. Life is what happens while you're waiting for something else. I don't think life is there to be regretted. You've got to make the most of it while you've got it. That's how you become the person you are. It's a picture of how any person, how they change. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. Is it important to fight? Yes. Tony was brought up in the East End of London. I want to be a jockey when I grow up. Yeah, I want to be a jockey when I grow up. At 14, he was already an apprentice at Tommy Gosling's racing stable at Epsom. At 15, he'd left school. This is a photo finish um, when I rode at Newbury. I'm the one with the white cap. I was beating a length and half a third and I had a photo finish. Do you regret not making it? Well, I would have given my white arm at the time to become a jockey, but now, no, I wasn't good enough. My greatest fulfilment in life, when I, when I rode at Kempton, in the same race as Lester Piggott. Proudest day of my life. What will you do if you don't make it as a jockey? Mm, I don't know. If I knew I couldn't be one, I'd get out of the game. Wouldn't bother. And what do you think you would do then? Long on taxes. At 21, he was on the knowledge, and by 28, he owned his own cab. I'll give you a story which happened. The doorman called me up, and it was Buzz Aldrin, the spaceman. And we drove out the forecourt of the hotel, and a cab pulled up, and taxi driver said, can you get his autograph? So I heard it and say, Mr. Aldrin, I said, can I have your autograph, please? And the cab, he said, no, I don't want his autograph. I want your autograph. And I couldn't believe it. I said, you're joking, ain't you? And to this day, I thought myself, you know, I'm more famous than Buzz Aldrin. He was the second man to land on the moon. At 42, Tony had left the East End and moved the family to Woodford in Essex. Well, I think we overspent about, um, oh, a colossal man. Thousands. At 49, they'd taken out a second mortgage on the London house and put the money into a holiday home in Spain. So it's seven years since we did this. It's flown by, Michael, just gone. What's life been like since we did 56 Up? Well, when we had our last interview, if you remember, I was in Spain and I was looking for a business to sort of set up. From here, there's going to be all commercial units here. My intentions would be to turn it, one of these units into a sports bar. Did you have financial difficulties? There was no money out there. All the businesses started to close. Audi had come along and built a brand new supermarket there. So all my aspirations and dreams went out the window. And people kept coming back from their dream also evaporating and they come back. So my wife and I, we decided to pack up and come back and sell our house and consolidate all our finances. I wished I was still there and I wished it was a vibrant city, which I could have had an input in because I would have loved to have maintained my property out there. It was a dream come true from a, a boy in the buildings. You must understand, I'm only a cabbie. Have you got a girlfriend? Nope. Would you like to have a girlfriend? No. Nope. You understand four Fs? Find them, feed them, and forget them. But with the other F, I'll let you use your own discrimination. I mean, this one, I tried to do the three Fs, but I couldn't forget her. And why did you fall in love with him? Don't know. I don't know. I don't, don't know, know how you put up with me for so long. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know how I stand him. I'm not proud at all to say this. But um, situations arise that I have um, I've had regretful behaviour various times. But through... You got uh, caught. No, no, no. And that was it. I owe Debbie everything because 
she stuck by me. And then at the end of it, I still love her so. And that's the reason why. So is this a tough time for cabbies at the moment? Uber and all these other companies trying to sort of take a piece of the cake, they're coming in and they're getting licenses willy-nilly. Is there a war going on between the, the cabbies and Uber? What they've done to the cab trade for a 250-year-old history, I cannot stress enough. So all the cabbies, 4,000 of us, got our placards. We marched to Downing Street on a uh, demonstration. And uh, I, for one, will be there again, beating my drum for the black taxi trade. How much have you lost in yearly salaries? I would what? certainly say a third, which is a big kick in the rear, and it's really hurtful. And what about Debbie? Has she been hit by it? Well, of course, we've all been hit by it. That's why I'm back in Essex now. Come on, Daisy. Come on. Look at that head on that horse. <laughs> oh, lovely. Really, it was me. I decided that I wanted to move from where we used to live. And I come up here one day and this one was up for sale. And then he came up here. Saw the horses. And he saw the horses out here and he fell in love with it. You've got to be 50 years old to live here. You've got a lot of elderly people here, but they're all ex-old EastEnders and they're all sort of like, you know, traditional EastEnders. It's all forest round here. Got a little pub up the road. If you go out there, you can get pie-eyed and walk down if you want. Nature is the winner for me. You know, I come home at night, I see foxes running about, reindeers at one o'clock in the morning after I've done a night's work in my cab. And life couldn't be better, really, living up here. How is life going for you two and your marriage? Yeah, solid. Would you say it's solid? Yeah, it's good at the moment, yeah. yeah. We've overcome a lot of ups and downs, but who don't? Do you notice a change in each other? Have we or what? I don't know. <laughs> Not really. Uh, He's never changed, has he, really? Well, he seems to me more grown up, more mature and everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know about that. that. <laughs> but no, um, I mean, he is what he is and nothing's going to change him. There's only one ambition, and really, I, I want a baby son. And if I see my baby son, that is my ambition fulfilled. No one knows that, only you now. <laughs> Debbie and Tony have three children Nikki, Jodie, and Perry. <laughs> Nikki, as you know, he was uh, a French polisher, which is a dying trade in, in England. So we funded him, me and Debbie, on the knowledge. I couldn't ask for more. To be more proud for uh, when he got his badge, it was it was a gift from God for what happened. Perry's at college at the moment, training to be a TA, teacher's assistant, because she wants to do a job that fits in with the schools. Now, whoever wins gets a packet of sweets, OK? We've got six grandchildren, the three young kids, Perry's kids, my youngest daughter. Quick! If it goes in, you get a fiver! Ooh! <laughs> Jodie's still trying to find her way in life. She's 37 now. Life's not been too good for her at this present time. Why? What are you going to get? Money? Debbie and I do everything we can to get her back on her feet. And... Excuse me. When you visually see it happening, you can see the change in her attitude, you can see the change in her appearance. It's, it's not a nice place to be watching your daughter struggle. Jody has a daughter, Tony. <laughs> Debbie and I have brought her up solely. All I can say is she's turned out beautiful. We're very proud of Tony. She's had to overcome a lot in her life, but She's doing well. Do you know all the girls and all the kids are going? She works hard in the pub. She saves her own money. She's got her own independence. An old head on young shoulders, Michael. She's very, very efficient. I'm in two golf societies. And who are the guys you play with? Well, they're mostly publicans or taxi drivers, you know. 
We always end up, you know, having a small bet. It's good. Great shot. Great shot. Right, turn on a man, OK? No, Tony, oh. no. <laughs> you took our money last week. I don't know what was straight to a tell us, Tony. Give us all the chance, would you? Let's go 4.60 on the metre, that has. So how's your health these days? I've got DVT, which is deep vein thrombosis. In condition from my family, from my brother, my sister, we've all been affected by DVT. And I'm on warfarin now for the rest of my life because I did have a pulmonary embolism, which I had a blockage and it went to my lung. If it would have gone to my brain or my heart, then I wouldn't be having this interview with you now. Nice one. That's in. I'm more health conscientious yeah, than yeah. I've ever been, really. Money, and, um... Well, you ain't, cos you eat a lot of chocolate. Well, I accept that. That's fair enough. Well, but, I mean, that's diet... Right, right, I'll give you that one. But I don't smoke and I don't drink. And trust me, I, I exercise. And most of all, I don't do any... <laughs> what they call it? Yeah, all right. <laughs> but that's machinery <laughs> under there, too. That's, a real... <laughs> that's not mine. No, it's not <laughs> In 1964, we asked Tony what he thought about the English class system. The pushing. Oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. They're nuts. You just have to touch them. Have you all got to work for it? And it's them, can you just ask for money and get it? And they can buy what they want. 55 to 20, boys. I'm one of the Thailanders. You think, oh, the East End boy, you know, and he ain't got a no good education. All of a sudden, the East End boy's got a car, a motorbike, and he goes to Spain every year. There's no education in this world. It's just one big rat race, and you've got to kill your man next to you to get in front of him. But at the end of the day, it's always them and us. And for me, it's still them and us. Obviously, if you come from with a silver spoon, you're going to get more attractive jobs and easier life and an easier success. But that don't mean they don't have to work for it. I feel that the economy it will bust within five years because people like myself have been giving and giving all the time. We're paying. You know, someone's getting it at our expense. What's your thinking about Brexit? Brexit? Well, I was a, a lever. I wanted to pass in my cab of the House of Commons and look up and think to myself, that's where we make this, the decisions, like Great Britain. And uh, I thought myself, you know, this is what I wanted. But then again, they've moved the goalposts. And even now, nearly two years down the line, I'm even getting second thoughts that we should have remained. I would never vote Tory again, and I've been a Tory vote for all my life. And um, probably I might even vote for the Greens. Do you have much to do with villains? I won't say I'm a villain myself. I don't go thieving or I don't do anybody any harm, fighting-wise. Does it worry you the possibility of becoming one of them? How can I, how can I become a villain? If it's not in there, if it's not born in there, you might become one. Yeah, you had visions of me being in the nick in the next seven years, you know, and um, you made a great mistake there, Michael. Well, thank God, yeah, but it, it, it seemed possible because things were pretty rough. I was 21. I mean, everyone's allowed to be 21. <laughs> Four and a half fifties. If your father gambled, I'll try my luck, see what he does. I'd never had visions of me being anything else other than a good citizen. I mean, I am a cheeky chappy, and I'll accept that, and I'll promise that sometimes I push the barrier to the limits. What's this walking? But in saying that, you are giving your truthful opinion at that particular time. And I've always worn my heart on the sleeve, and I've always, I like to think so, give you a credible, truthful, honest opinion on what's going on in my life. I mean, I, that's the way I am. Tell me, son, what do you want to be a cab driver for, mate? All the holidays in Spain every year, but son, it's hard work out here. Come on, you're not reaching me yet. Not getting to No, me. you're not getting to me, all right? Now, be bigger. Dominate me, all right, son? At 28, yeah. Tony was taking son, acting lessons. Yeah. Now he supplements his income with occasional TV jobs. Oi! That's all I got on me. Mate, if I had a pamper every time I've heard that, I'd be a rich man. 
it's exciting times for me because I've got a part in a film and uh, it's showing a premiere tonight. I've been struggling as a film extra in 1976 when I first started on the Sweeney. Last year was a child in time with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Debbie's over there at the bar. She's a bit uh, nervous about it. I mean, hopefully that I've, I've come out with some credibility on the part. And most of all, I wanted to say to her, if she sees her husband up there rather than uh, the character, then I know I haven't done my job. You fucking tell that Chinaman he'd be in there eating egg fried rice in a minute. Right. What's the matter with you? It's called 90 Minutes. But the best thing about it was the cast and crew all become one big family. And uh, it was a joy to go and work on Acne Marshes incidentally where I used to play football and referee and it was like going home. Uh, would everybody please sit round now, get on with their work, I don't want to see any back to me. Tony, do you hear as well? One of the things at the beginning of the program is show me the child and I will show you the man. Um, you look at me at seven and you look at me even now at 63, there's no possible way that you can't say that's not him now and that's not him then. You got it right with me. I read the Financial Times. I read Observer and the Times. I'm going to chart a house. And after that, Trinity Hall. Cambridge. Andrew went to Charterhouse and Cambridge, where he read law. I'd like to be a solicitor and also fairly successful. At 28, Andrew was a solicitor. What do you think about girlfriends at your age? Okay. Tell me what you think no, about I've got one, but I don't think much of her. They're no longer just bores <laughs> who won't play this or something. And you can begin to talk to them. I don't think I financially come from the same background. Mm, um, Andrew didn't go for a haughty Deb. He went for a good Yorkshire lass. By the time he was 28, Andrew had married Jane. Well, I suppose the most important thing that's happened is that we've had two children, one five years ago, Alexandra, and then a couple of years later, Timothy. By 35, he'd become a partner in his law firm. And later, he joined the legal department of a large British industrial company. A few years after, they were taken over by a German firm. So how are the other members of the family? Well, Alexander, who um, was going out with Philippa when we last met, got married about three and a half years ago. And they're now both working and living in London. Timothy um, worked for a management consultancy in the IT area and then decided to specialise in IT, and he's gone to Birmingham University and he's reading computer science there. Andrew and Jane live in London, but they have a second home in the country. Well, we bought it about just when we uh, got married, and it was a 200-year-old barn that uh, we bought in an auction, completely derelict, nothing in it at all except for manure. I remember the garden when you were like up to your eyeballs in weeds and stuff like that. Well, we moved in about 35 years ago and we've been working on it ever since, really. It's a never-ending job. I think the country has helped with him relaxing when he's had very intense periods of working. Don't you ever have any arguments or oh, disagreements? Yes, of course we do. And how do you tend to sort them out? Jane oh. is always right. <laughs> <laughs> if only. <laughs> He's quite strong in his decisions, and I'm not. <laughs> so it really compliments me that he can help me to make a decision when I'm umming and ahhing. Well, you be careful, sweetheart. Yeah, well, I'll be careful. I think I'll hold the ladder for you. OK, thank you. The latest thing we did, we went to Japan a few years ago, and we saw some very nice Japanese gardens in Kyoto and we decided that we'd have a go at doing something like that here as well. Most dangerous things I do, climb up that ladder. <laughs> <laughs> Work is pretty stressful, isn't it? Yeah, I'm pretty used to it now. I've been doing it for 40 years, so you get pretty <laughs> used to it. Um, but in fact, I'm retiring at the end of this year, um, which I'm looking forward to. Come on, Millie, 
let's go. Where are we going? <gasps> we're going to... One of the reasons why I wanted to retire now is really because we're relatively young to make the most of that time. We're in a bit of a sweet spot now, I think, in terms of going traveling and so on. Maybe in five, ten years' time, that won't be possible. Yes. And the worst thing is you hear about people who retire and then just drop dead. Looking back, I would have liked to have spent a bit more time with the family, you know, rather than giving so much priority to work. When you're young and trying to make your career, it all seems terribly important to you to spend that extra few hours at the office. But in the scheme of things, it probably would have been better to, yeah. you know, go to the school play or the sports day or whatever. I mean, my mother died three years ago, and that was quite sad to see her deteriorate. Yeah. And make you realize, you know, what's, what's in store for you. And you can never be sure of leaving your children in any worldly goods, but at least you can be sure that once you've given them a good education, that's something that no one can take away. Did you ever resent going to boarding school? I did go very young, and we did decide that we would not send our children to boarding school at such young an age. I think it's still an age when you really want to be the one who has the most influence on their lives, rather than them spending their lives with some third party who's going to influence them. The dream for us is that our children have a happy and fulfilling life. Do you think you have? Yeah, I think I've been very fortunate. But you've worked for it. Yes, as they will have to. When I have go home, I have tea. Then I practice my piano. One of the things about the series is the idea that to see the man in the child, is that true? You know, obviously, at the age of seven, you're very much a product of your upbringing up to then. I can quite, have quite strong feelings, but Jane's been quite a good influence on me over the years. Thank you. So making me more mellow, including in my driving and that sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, do you think there's any truth in the ideas behind the programme, that certain people have more options than others, and this is undesirable? We do have more options. Thing. And it is undesirable, but it's very difficult to correct. I think the class system itself is now based more on fame and what you've achieved in financial terms. Achievement is obviously more appropriate than what class you were born into. What's it actually been like being in the programme? I certainly don't look forward to it every seven years, but because I don't have a particularly good memory, it's quite interesting for me to see what I was like when I was younger as well. I think we still all feel very nervous doing this, but I suppose as you get a bit older, you feel less yeah. inhibited. Maybe going back to what you were like, when, not quite going back to what you were like when you were seven, but um, you've got less to lose, I guess. If we did all um, love Geoffrey and we all want to marry him, yeah, I think I know the one that he'd like. And that's her. She keeps changing her mind, though. Yeah, I don't know which one, really. Sue grew up in the East End of London. I don't think I'd uh, get married too early. <clears throat> I'd like to have a full life first. Marriage just means a different thing to me. I've still got my ideals about marriage. I don't know what it's all about. Sue was 24 when she married Billy, and they had two children. 60! To get married young, there must be things that you miss. You must miss that crucial stage of being yourself, because the minute you get married, you're no longer a, a single being. You're a partnership, and that should be the idea behind it. By the time Sue was 35, she was divorced. I've never sat down and thought, well, what was it? Was it this? Was it that? I just knew it wasn't working. I mean, there have been relationships when I could have could have settled, but they didn't feel quite right. So I've always come away and pulled away and just waited until the right one come along, <laughs> if they ever do. At 42, when we filmed Sue in the karaoke bar, she brought Glenn along to watch her sing. Well, we've been engaged now for about 14 years. <laughs> Uh, I've not beaten any records, but it's quite a long time, isn't it? Yeah. 
So, what is the status with you and Glenn? We're still in the middle of the longest engagement known to man. Uh, we've been together now over 20 years. Still not married. Never say never. But no plans. Goldfish. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're both fine as it is. And if we do it, it's just going to be, let's do it. A spur of the moment thing. And, you know, we love each other. We've got a nice life. The boat. He came along at, a, at the right time for me. I've been on my own with the kids for quite a few years. He probably had the worst years, really, you know, the teenage years, but he stuck around, bless him. We go to Zanti. He's been so supportive. There's been some medical stuff and some scary stuff going on, and he's been there and he's been my rock. Sometimes we go out and play nicely with the boys, and sometimes we go out and argue with the boys. He's having a new love in his life, which has been very, very difficult for me. Who are you on the phone to? <laughs> what do you mean? Motorbikes. God. But... <sighs> he does like me to get involved in this, and I won't get on the back of it. And not yet. Maybe when he's had a few more years of experience under his belt. Have you and Glenn thought of having your own child? Well, Glenn got with me when I was in my 40s, and I didn't want to do all that again. I would have loved to have had a baby, because he would make a wonderful parent. But the timing was off. So she's your baby? She's my new baby, yeah. Yeah, my kids are my babies, but she's my new baby. So... She's our baby, <laughs> mine and Glenn's. <laughs> We lost our Jessie, and Jessie was the star. She got to a good old age, and uh, we lost her. The grief is unbearable when you lose a dog. People with pets will know. And then a friend of mine asked me to take her dog, and they brought her around to meet as well. It was like, how could you not love her? You know, she's gorgeous. Hang on, Moles. I do quite a bit of typing, but a lot of my work is involved in making bookings and dealing with hotels abroad. At 21, Sue worked for a travel agent. At 35, part-time for a building society. Everything's changed for me because I'm now supporting myself a lot more. At 42, she went back to work full-time, helping to run the courses in the legal faculty of Queen Mary College, University of London. At 49, she was the main administrator for their postgraduate program. Do you like the responsibility? Yeah, I love the responsibility. I think I was born for the responsibility. You can't do two modules that are taught at the same time, obviously. You know, it's physically impossible for us to timetable every single module. Nothing really has changed. I'm still working for Queen Mary, 20 years under my belt. But I still enjoy it. Once you get to your 60s, it all gets a bit... Oh, like, how long have we got now? <laughs> like, how many years is it? You know, <laughs> counting down, but no, still got the energy, thank goodness. So what happens when you get to your 70s, you think? Oh, God. Well, you tell me, Michael, you know. <laughs> I've worked all my life, you know. I can't imagine not working. I work at home one day a week now, which is good because the central line was killing me. Um, it's such an awful experience. Thank you very much. You. See you at graduation, yeah? yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Do you have a retiring age there? Or... I think mine is uh, 66. I say I'm not looking forward to it, but I don't know really if I am because I can't imagine how what it's like to fill your days. Where does the life of my respectable middle-class mother overlap with a working-class slapper who leaves a illegitimate child on a church doorstep? She was not! You don't know! She... I still do my drama, I do my lovey stuff, as Glenn calls it. I like to sing, perform, and that's my hobby. Cheers! <laughs> Cheers to the enlarged... Cheers. <laughs> Today, we're having a very lovely afternoon tea. So it's just a small gathering, just to celebrate my birthday. When I got married, the primary reason was because I wanted to have a child. Uh, the two, to me, went together. 
<laughs> How are the two children doing? Brilliantly. They've both bought their own flats and they're both independent people, good jobs. Both my kids are single still. Both haven't met Mr. Bright. They seem to be happy and uh, they're, they're a joy to me. Well, I'm telling you now that a little pink cake over there. And I do worry about the future for younger generations. You know, what's going to happen? Because the NHS cannot carry on like this. It can't cope. It can't cope now. I think I'm probably the last generation that will get a decent NHS service. Don't like people too posh. They, they look down on everybody else. I think they're better. Yeah. At the roots of this film is the class system. Do you think it's still alive and well? You are what you're born into. You'll never be upper class because you're born into yeah. upper class. But you can mix in those circles. I mean, I don't know. I've never been upper class. I'm never likely to be upper class in my life. Working class always. I don't, I don't see why they should have the luck when people have worked all their lives and haven't got half as much as what they have. It just don't seem fair. People are struggling now. Benefits are not what they used to be. I mean, I work in London, so I see homeless people all the time. I don't remember it being that bad when I was younger. I suspect it was there, but I don't remember it being as bad as that. <laughs> My generation, we had wonderful support from the council, which meant that if you were, your parents were council tenants, you would get a council house, which got me into a house, which then enabled me to buy it and, and get onto the housing ladder and uh, change my life. But that's not there anymore. Now, council housing is so difficult to get. You know, you've practically got to be homeless. What would you do if you had lots of money about, um, me, two pounds? Me? One of the premises of the film is give me a child until you're seven and I will show you the man. Do you think mm. that's true? I think it probably is, to an extent. But you never fight with them? You can be born shy. You can be born as an extrovert. <laughs> you can be someone who likes to make people laugh. You can be someone who's much quieter and deeper. And I think that's in you. But then life happens, and every experience will change you. Yeah, yeah. My mum and dad, thank the Lord, are still with us and fighting, fit, not fit, but fighting to be fit, you know. My mum's currently in hospital. <laughs> I'm not sure how you pronounce it. I mean, I've lost family members, yeah, and, and that, everything's sad, but I can't say I've had a huge tragedy in my life yet, mm. Michael. You know, we know... Um, we know what's coming. Smile, though your heart is aching, smile. Do you think that these films have any value? Well, they have a value to me because it's a lifelong achievement uh, to be part of this programme, you know? And I'm astounded sometimes by the people that I meet and they all know about this programme. They might not have watched all of it, but they'll have a, a memory from it. They pick up on things that I think affect them. The things we go through are what everyone's going through. Cheers! <laughs>
energy and sent out to the consumer. How hot is it in there? In there, it's at about 10 million degrees. At 35, he was an associate professor, and at 42, a full professor. My ambition as a scientist is to be more famous for doing science than for being in this film, but unfortunately, Michael, it's not going to happen. <coughs> now, you want some water? <coughs> you want constant water here? I am seriously ill. I have a cancer in my throat, and I don't know what the prognosis, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm not really focused on the long-term future. I'm focused on fairly short-term futures at the moment. A lot of the treatments that I've been having are things that are not good for your blood. And I'd had a couple of them in rapid succession, I guess. And so, yeah, my blood's a bit thin at the moment. 10 days ago, I went in and had a blood test and the nurse told me that f the, the level of my hemoglobin was such that she expected me to be in a wheelchair. Do you have a girlfriend? <laughs> I don't want to answer that. I don't answer those kind of questions. I thought that one would come up because when I was... When I was doing the other one, somebody said, what do you think about girls? And I said, I don't answer questions like that. Is that the reason you're asking it? <laughs> the best answer would be to say that I don't answer questions like that. But, I mean, <laughs> you know, it was what I said when I was seven, and it's still the most sensible. But, I mean, what about them? I mean, if, if you'd been somebody who had had fixed ideas of a woman's role in marriage that meant dinner on the table at six every evening. Ah, um, uh, didn't I tell you about that? <laughs> By 28, Nick had married Jackie, a fellow student from Oxford. We don't want to miss out on the chance of having a significant career, and we don't want to miss on the chance, out on the chance to have kids and to be involved with them. The one, the moment of pure, unadulterated joy in my life was when my son was handed to me when he was born. I have never felt so optimistic, so just purely unworried about anything as that. That it was just the strength. It was just. Phew. So that that's. Did that last forever? <laughs> well, no. I mean, no, no. I'm, no, he didn't. By forty-two, they were divorced. What I concluded, and I've talked to other people about this who've gone through it, I'm not sure if they feel it as strongly as I did, but it, it was like a death. If your spouse died, you could look back and think, well, it was wonderful while it lasted. But in a divorce, you can't look, you can't look back and say, these are all happy memories. You can talk to me by myself outside, but I'll just meet you by the garage, OK? All right. All right, bye. Nick's son, Adam, was 10 when his parents divorced. When he was first told, he was terribly, terribly upset. And then he just pulled himself together and didn't want to talk about it anymore. Take it easy, Adam. Main thing is not to crash. Really? You don't want me to crash right now? How do you deal with it now? He doesn't talk to me about it very much at all. He's a private person. He's getting more mature, and he has to be very patient with me, really. Can you imagine having me for a dad? Do you think it would be a low-pressure existence? Hey, Chris, who is my new wife. I'm OK. I don't mean to be superficial, but I think she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And how's married life? Well, the, me being very ill has certainly made ever, been a bit of a damper on things, but Chris is being actually a complete angel about it. Over the years, Nick's research hit trouble, and by 42, he was forced to abandon it. Um. When I was 13, I got hold of a book which said that we were really in trouble because of pollution. And because of this, I went into this nuclear fusion thing. 
So I made some choices to start working in this field that handicapped me later. Because I still can't make it work. There were scientists in essentially the same organization I was in saying, you cannot build these things. So I had to pay attention. I had to try and do something different. So the area that I'm looking at is this times this. Put them at I don't know why I have a compulsion to teach, really. It was just always there in me. I just wanted to do it. I thought I'd be good at it. So I'm hoping that you will remember me being very stupid and going, ow, there's arrows. Are you still teaching? Yes. My students are wonderful. Yes, that, that's really impressive. I'm hanging in there as long as I can with them. Apparently he was a bit of a jerk. It's great to be around them. Unless they've got a cold and they're insisting on coughing on me. I try to get them not to cough on me, but it's a bit hard to, hard to deflect them. What attracts you about America? It's an exciting place to be. There's a lot going on. It's much easier to go out and get things done than in England. When you came here, was it a surprise to you? America was quite different than I would have expected. What do you make of Trump? Oh, gosh. I don't know how much of what he says is for effect and how much he believes. And that's, that's the huge question in my mind. Yeah. Theresa May was at Oxford at the same time as me. You don't get to do that uh, going to uh, Bradford Polly. Okay, yes, so this was my staircase on my, in my foot. You're still seeing that people from the right public schools continue to run the country. The, those people are not necessarily the, the, the ones who are most fit to, uh, to run the country. They have a superficial glibness. They can present themselves well on a podium, but it's alarming that they are the only ones who have a, ch a, a clear route to, to running the country. They'd like to come out for a holiday in the country when we like, when I like to have a holiday in the town. Do you want to take up farming? No. I'm not interested in it. My youngest brother's a deaf one. If he can't do anything else, he can probably run a farm. But as a last resort... It's a fixed reference point, in a sense, the sort of earthy life and death cycle that you get living on a farm. What did you learn here, do you think, that you've carried with you? I, I sort of feel as if you could look deep somewhere inside me. I feel like there's some of this in there somewhere. I think of it as being magnificent, but rather grim, really. And sometimes it's rather tragic, but, you know, it uh, makes other places you go seem rather trivial as well. Well, I come up uh, most weekends, and then Chris gets up usually in uh, midweek. We don't get over to England very often, and so you can count on one hand how many times you're going to see your family before somebody dies. And that's getting more and more pressing every time we come. Have I seen you since you lost your dad? No. I loved my dad a lot, but he was an old man, and he was in his mid-80s. I mean, the last time I saw him, there wasn't much left of him. He was a tiny little frail thing who didn't have much to say. I, I don't... Okay. Don't know, I mean, you know, you, you know me, Michael. I, I, I'm sure I haven't dealt with it fully. Yeah. But, um... Yeah. But it's full of emotion, always. It's all the stuff that we repress as hard as we can, isn't it? But, um... Yeah, it really is. If I can change the world, I'd change it into a diamond. I'm still the same little kid, really. Probably all of us are. I think I can relate to that little guy. He was sort of all eager and earnest, trying to answer the questions, <laughs> you know? So, yes, I, I, think, I think you can tell I'm still the same kid. 
I think this film is extremely important. It's important to me, but it seems to be important to other people as well. That doesn't make it an easy thing. It's an incredibly hard thing to be in, and I can't even begin to describe how emotionally draining and wrenching it is just to make the film and to do the interviews. And that's even when I'm pretending that nobody else is watching it. It isn't a picture really of the essence of Nick. It's a picture of every man. It's how a person, any person, how they change. It's, it's made me think about all sorts of things more intensely than I probably would have otherwise. There are lots of issues that it right aises that I've stewed over over the years. It certainly highlights the difference between living in America and England. Relationships with spouses is given more intensity and focus by being discussed. What has been the saddest thing? I mean, right now, I'm I'm struggling with being ill, and I'm very sad for the people who are being affected by that. I don't know. I Life doesn't turn out the way I expect. Are you frightened about it? Not for myself, but for them a bit. Yeah, I'm frightened for them. And what about the other children? Where are they now? What are they doing? I would like to get married when I grow up. I don't think you want to go to university if you want to be an astronaut. I'm going to work in Woolworth. My heart's desire is to see my daddy. <laughs> In 1964, Granada Television brought together a group of seven-year-olds. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. We have followed their lives every seven years. I don't want to keep still. It's life, you know. Don't wait for nobody. They talked about their dreams. If I could have two girls and two boys. Their ambitions. I'd quite like to get into politics. And their fears for the future. Life is what happens while you're waiting for something else. I don't think life is there to be regretted. You've got to make the most of it while you've got it. That's how you become the person you are. It's a picture of how any person, how they change. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. Alden, let's have the present tells of Vesta. Vesta, Vesta, Vesta. Vesta, 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 Vesta. Yeah, speak up. When he was seven, Bruce was at boarding school. My heart's desire is to see my daddy, who's 6,000 miles away. His parents divorced. At the age of 11, Bruce moved to St Paul's School in London as a boarder. You know, I'm having, I've been getting on well with my stepfather. And I like to see my father occasionally. And he does come over from Rhodesia at St Paul's. I like the companionship, you know, with other boys. You can show that at 21, he was at Oxford University studying maths. Well, there was one job which I, I quite, I'd quite like to make maps, really. But there are very few jobs that like that going. Chris, I'll be. Yes, sir. After Oxford, he yes, worked in the city for a year, yes, then decided to teach. He taught in a state school. It's so different from your own education where you're teaching now. General education is better for society, I think. Public schools are divisive. 
Do you understand the game? I think there is a class society, and I think uh, public schools may help its continuance. At 35, Bruce took a sabbatical and taught in Bangladesh. OK, because you've got to get the next squared, OK? I see education as a key to it all, Good. you know. Good. I mean, I think once your population okay. becomes educated, it can think for itself squared. a lot more and create minus wealth five. and create opportunities. That's good. OK. The, the straight line, yes. At 42, going, 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 he was back in the East End yeah. so no, no, as head of the maths there. department yeah, at a girls' comprehensive school. Yeah. At 49, we found him teaching at St Albans, an independent school. By you don't multiply but by three. Divide, divide, divide by, by, by three. Okay. Tell me so then what's exciting about three. teaching here for you. There is a higher academic level to teach. And then you can see pupils at a more developed level, that flash of recognition, and then engendering their love of the subject that, that, you, that I had at their age. Do your old friends give you a hard time about what you've done? They certainly do. They absolutely do. They say, oh, you know, have we joined the Tory party, the golf club, the Masons, you know? Well, my girlfriend is in Africa, and I won't... I don't think I'll have another chance of seeing her again. Have you got any girlfriend? No, no, not yet. I'm sure it will come. Yes, I haven't got married or whatever. And I suppose, you know, that, that would have been something which I hoped had happened. Well, you're getting on a bit. Are you getting worried? Well, not particularly. I mean, I'm always optimistic. I mean, who knows I'm, who I might meet tomorrow. And in the middle of a conversation about something completely different, he just asked if, um, if I'd like to marry him. And if I hadn't been listening carefully, I would have missed it completely. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. We don't argue very much. Not really. I mean, we haven't really had a sort of full-blown row. No, you know, just our think... arguments sort of tend to be <clears throat> two sentences and I go off and salt for 24 hours. So is Bruce getting any better at expressing his feelings to you? Um... Not, not really, by the sound of that. <laughs> I always say I would never divorce him, but I may, may well murder him at some point. <laughs> what, meaning what? I, I mean, I have some infuriating habits, which... When he's travelling. Yeah. And he gets into arguments with vending machines. I don't know. I, How I, has being married to Penny changed you? I haven't been lonely. I've appreciated companionship. <laughs> I mean, is there a balance of power, or do you have to run with imbalance, or what? Well, there's... I wouldn't go against Penny. It, life would not be, uh, <laughs> ...easy after that. But, um, you know, generally speaking, we're in agreement about most things. We may have children if, in seven years' time or so, we, we're living in a slightly bigger house with a, a young family. That would be nice. Come on then, Henry, get on. Bruce and Penny had two sons, Henry and George. <laughs> oh, pull out, because I'll take the lead. Oh. Are you ambitious for them? Yeah, I mean, some people work ferociously hard, and while that's rewarding and they enjoy that and they enjoy the success and so on, you just hope they get a nice balance to their lives. We've always had a family holiday and this might be one of the last because the boys are getting older 19 and 17 and they might want to go off by themselves if in the future were we to offer the boys basically a free holiday in somewhere exciting like new york they wouldn't turn it down oh so we can't get away on our own i don't think we're ever going to get away on our oh, own like that no God. henry the bagels do you mind getting them out of the oven most of my work life is over now, but I am doing a little bit of work. I'm teaching a bit in Penny's school now, but I still have plenty to do, looking after all the relatives or treasurer for the Quakers. Has the issue of money been important in the household? Well, that's partly why I'm still working a bit, because we have to help the boys through university, 
Each month we pay in a certain amount into the common sort of bank account, and she contributes more than I do now. I mean, I'm quite happy to be kept by Penny in any style to which I'm happy to be, you know, accustomed to. Okay, I just looked up on Twitter, George, making scrambled eggs. And, and so she's still a successful professional. Yes, I mean, she's actually got quite an important job. She's head of sixth form. She's in charge of all the A-level courses, all the UCAS university applications. Are you completely in sync about bringing up the boys? We are generally, yes. We want to give them a good moral basis, a good education. It's slightly irritating that neither have got any idea of what they want to do yet, but that's... What, what would you put that down to? Is that the, the times they're living in? Possibly, because in our age, you tended to have one career. Are they both deeply involved in the internet? Well, they're both on social media and text and WhatsApp and all that kind of thing. There are various things that I can do, they can't do. They can't change a plug or change a light bulb, oh. but I can't get on Netflix, so... Oh. I have to ask them to help me. Yep, brace it up. So is he playing as much Bruce as he used to? No. No. And when he does, he usually manages to pull a muscle, so... Hey, welcome to Kansas Deli. How are you guys doing? You guys want waiter service or want to do self-service? I'm trying to get my weight down, which is pathetic, but I should really adjust my diet as well. There's more of a chance of getting diabetes, so I'm trying to ward that off. But I go to the gym, I play golf, occasionally I play cricket, but that's more and more awkward these days. Is Penny on your case about this? I mean, I suppose if I asked her to kind of be stricter on what I was allowed to eat, that would help. It's less easy to do when the boys are at home because I can't stand leftovers. So I will always finish their plates. OK, now, if they're not there, I won't have their plates to finish, so... Do you have any fears for the future? I think disabling degenerative condition linked with old age, that, that fills me with dread. I said to Penny, if I'm going first and quickly, you know. I think discipline is fair enough. And that's far heat gives me nightmares. I suppose I was too young, really, to understand it. And I thought it was a bit severe at the time, but then I just got used to it. In that school and the two schools I went to after that, I, I was beaten many times. And that's just what happened. And sometimes you didn't know why you were being beaten. But nevertheless, it just, that, that's, that's what happened. Oh, you're, a, you're a queen porn man. Uh, Sometimes. Yeah, I think we've talked about this before, about expressing your feelings. Is that still yeah. an issue? I think it is, whether it's boarding school life or wherever it's happened to be. You tend to try and fit in and, and not express yourself so much because that can be uh, disruptive. And I, I think to a certain extent I've, I've had a sort of restricted, if you like, emotional state, which uh, I, I've learned to live with. At 63, we took him back to the school in the East End, where he started his teaching career. Looking back, I, I derive most satisfaction from teaching here. You had to be on your toes. I mean, it was quite edgy. But if the students felt you were committed to them and their progress, they joined in with you and worked well. I think it opened up my viewpoint to, you know, what Britain is now. Living in a council flat over there, coming here, it was a side of Britain I'd never really been in. Six times three is 18, shared by two is nine. I was hoping that the students would go on and had successful lives and fulfilled lives and realize their potential. What I didn't want them to do is thinking because of our background, this is what we're limited to do, that anything was possible. Have you experienced failure in any part of your life? I've not had a sort of stunningly successful education career. I've not, say, become a deputy head or head teacher. But I, I never particularly wanted to because you tend to move out of the classroom. 
Fill up the gaps on the board down. Has a bit of chalk. I think we should give most of our money to the poor people. I'd help people if I had a chance. Basically, we don't care that many countries are incredibly poor. We simply don't care. I mean... The 35, you seemed to have really strong ideals. They were very powerful and powerfully expressed. And then suddenly there's been a switch. Um, well, partly, I think it's having a family, because when you get a family, your priorities change, and you start looking after your family more than looking further afield. You look back at life, and is it a good feeling? Lots to look on with fondness and pleasure and good memories. A happy marriage and two fine boys that uh, we're proud of, and a body of work that I had my successes with, some failures, but still plenty to do. It's not all over yet. I know that's not possible to be happy all the time, but as much of the time that was possible. By the time she was 21, Jackie had married Mick and moved to the outskirts of London. Hey, it's Jackie. She and Mick had decided early on that they didn't want to have children. Basically, I would say because I'm far too selfish. I enjoy doing what I want, when I want, and how I want. And uh, certainly at the moment, I, I, I can't see any way around that. By 35, she was divorced. We decided between the two of us. We knew it wasn't going any further. <clears throat> we both knew, I think, that at the end of the day, we would be happier leading our own lives. And <laughs> this one on? Oh, yeah. Had a yeah. brief, but very sweet <laughs> relationship, the result of which was Charlie. Oh, Kiss a cuddle. Kiss I don't really want Charlie to be an only. I'd love him to have brothers and sisters. Right, Charlie. Please eat it all up. And James. Thanks, Mum. Good boy. And last but not least. Gonna eat that one for me? After her relationship with no. Charlie's father ended, she met Ian, and they moved to Scotland and had two sons. By 42, they had split up. Has Charlie shown any interest as to his father? No. Ian's his father, as far as he's concerned. He's just done everything with him, been everything to him, taught him everything. At 49, despite the split, the family were living in the same area of Scotland. They are still there. And how are the boys doing? Really well. They're all working away, which is nice, especially in this day and age. Charlie's still doing his chefing. He seems to be happy where he is. There you go, chef. James is um, in a warehouse. Lee is still in the army. He's a medic, basically. Still got two of the boys living at home, which I love, but they should really have moved on by now. It was really nice to see her. This is my birthday celebration, and I've invited family and friends, and obviously my beautiful grandchildren at the end. That's Mia, that's Tyler. My mum, because she got five girls, shared them seven years bad luck. That's why she's got five girls. I was 30 years old when I lost my mum. And my dad was my rock. Oh, nice. But as he got older, dementia set in. He went in for an operation. And he had the operation done. My oldest sister, Jan, went in. She rang me and said, he, he won't talk to me. 
And I said to him, Dad, what are you doing? What, what's going on? What are you doing? And he said, I'm slowly killing myself. And that was, that was really awful. After running around with the kids all day, and... he stopped all his medication. He knew he was dying and he wanted to get it over with. He really wanted to be wherever my mum and my stepmum and that are. So I imagine they had a big party when he got there. <laughs> my mum and my stepmum might have had a disagreement about it, but, you know. Unfortunately, on the 18th of November, Ian, the boy's dad, was severely injured in a road traffic accident. He um, subsequently died of those injuries. That was a monumental mess. He was at a zebra crossing. The light to the traffic was red, the light on the crossing was green. He walked out and she took him off his feet. Every bone in his body was broken. The boys were devastated. Charlie was absolutely terrible. He had to have counselling. In all, it was nearly four and a half years before we got any justice. And we got a guilty verdict. She had run him over and, and it wasn't anything his fault. Not half bad, good. And did you get any compensation yeah. out of it at no. the end of the day? No, not at all. Pancakes. The boys got... I think they got about £3,000. Each. That was it. That was it. Great, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's all the dad's life was worth. Mm. <laughs> as much as Ian and I didn't live with each other, it didn't mean that we didn't love each other. I couldn't live with him, but I don't think I've ever stopped loving him. If you think that getting married, as far as we're concerned, is a case of going to work, come home, cook tea for hubby, going to bed, coming, getting up, going to work, you, you're totally mistaken. When we were younger, I kept thinking, why is he asking me questions about marriage and men? And why, why is he not asking me questions about how the country is? Do you think you've settled down too young? No. I've married and we do things together. Or... But I felt that you treated yeah, I mean, us know. as women of totally different and I didn't like it. Now, I appreciate that when we started at seven, most women were in the kitchen or were bringing up children. There weren't many career women. But by the time we hit 21, I really thought you'd have had a better idea of <laughs> how the world works, shall I say. Did you meet enough men before you decided who to marry? I've been married a year and... But you still asked us the most mundane domestic question, and I really want you to go... <laughs> So by 49, I actually thought, you know what, no more. I'm not having this anymore. And that's why I got very vocal with you. What happened at 21? You asked me if I'd had enough experience with men before I got married. And I thought that was actually an insulting question and I got very angry and we actually stopped filming because of it. No. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what, Susan. I was really angry that you even thought you could get... You wouldn't have asked some of the other people in this programme that question. And I just didn't feel that you had any idea of the changing role of women in the UK at that point. I've had the opportunities in life that I've wanted. I say I've you've had made. more opportunities. Oh, no. Yeah, right, you've made. As you get older, you realise just how lucky you've been. And I do think I've been lucky. Walked out of school straight into any job I wanted. Could you have done more education? Oh, yeah. And I should have done. All I wanted to do was go out and earn money. And that was short-sightedness that did that. Mm. That wasn't... It wasn't that I particularly wanted to go to university, but I, I probably should have done further education. So where are we? To get up this one, it's not so bad. We're in Norfolk. Good. This is my sister's home. Both our families are grown, so we get to spend a lot more time together, which is brilliant. James, you watch, you're catching up to him. 
I was working up here until very recently, um, but they've discovered that I've got rheumatoid arthritis. So at the moment, that's put work on hold. All right. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Rheumatoid arthritis can flare up, and then it can ease down, it can flare up. And it's so frustrating. You just have to live with it, Michael. You can't... You can't let it rule your life. Jackie has been getting disability benefits for over 20 years. For nearly a decade, the government has been reassessing all benefits. I can understand that the government needed to make cuts. They had people there who they knew would never get better, and they still put down fit to work. I waited nine months for my appeal to come through. I had to live on £40 a week. I was lucky. I had family that could help me with money. But a lot of people haven't got that behind them. People were killing themselves because they were getting into so much debt. I would like to get married when I grow up. I've been on my own for a long while, Michael, with the kids. Either men my age don't want that hassle because my kids are still at home. They can't move out. They can't afford to. Or it was just, you know, sort of a quickie around the bike shed and I wasn't really wanting that offer, so... <laughs> I actually rang my sister one day and I said, listen, if I need a plus one, will you come? And she said, of course I will. So everything now that I get invited to, if Ray can make it, she's there. We decided we'd come up here for a meal for Christmas. And we go on holidays and considering when we were young and living at home, we could have hit each other as soon as said good morning. But the minute she got married and moved out, I was there every weekend. <laughs> yeah. We all have ups and downs, and but my downs have always coincided with me ringing Ray, and Ray then talks to me and helps me get through it and sort out a way to get through things. I mean, what's your feeling about having been in the programme and survived it? I've done more than survived it. Well, I mean, I've loved we're, it. We're all still alive. You know I've loved it. And Good. I have. People always, you know, oh, my God, you had a right go at him. What was that all about? And I'm like... I told him off. I didn't kill him. Jacqueline, what do you think about boys fighting? Well, they're really, it's really... When you look at the seven up, you think that's me? Actually, I think there's a core of it that's, that rings true. Because I've never really changed, Michael. I mean, you've got to be honest. I was always talkative and a bit of a pain in the butt. Your character, perhaps, is set by seven. But I don't think you can predict what that child's going to be. Because I think at seven, your whole world's open. Yeah. Mia now goes, do I have to do homework at high school? And I go, yes. And then you have to do it at uni. What's uni? University. Because you're going. And she looks at me and she goes, am I? I said, yeah, you are. Because then the world's your oyster. I don't want her to have tunnel vision, which I think I had when I was younger. Oh, dear, I'm here. beginning to feel a bit chilly. Really? Talking about anybody else, yeah. Children need to know that they are capable of doing anything. If you open the child's mind, to the possibilities, it's, oh, it's probably the best thing you can do. I don't think you want to go to university if you want to be an astronaut. Watch this. Peter and Neil were childhood friends growing up in Liverpool. Peter went to a comprehensive school and went on to get a history degree from London University. I would like to think that democracy is here to stay. Perhaps we haven't got full democracy. In fact, we probably haven't. It's a, it's a pretty good system. Uh, I don't want to get dragged into party politics, you know, but basically this is the most 
incompetent, uncaring bloody show we've ever had. After 28 Up, Peter decided not to continue in the film. I pulled that because of the responses and the reactions that um, my participation drew, particularly in the tabloid press. They decided they were going to portray me as the angry young red in Thatcher's England. I think I was articulating at the time what a lot of people of my age and my background were thinking, and I was an easy target. A part of it, they perpetuated. Was it painful coming back? <laughs> do you regret coming back? <laughs> yeah, of course I do. I'm, I'm sitting here talking to you now, and I'm squirming. <laughs> I'm squirming. I'm thinking every two minutes or so, I'm replaying what I just said to you and thinking, oh, my God, you idiot. <laughs> Why did you say that? <laughs> so, you know, there's that. So why, why did you come back? Because I want to promote the music and the band I'm in. But when he hit that bang... I'd always played in rock bands, some of them spectacularly bad bands. <laughs> the band has essentially been a, a duo. It originally was a trio, and then we lost Frank three years ago. So we're the, essentially the core of it, and people come in and play with us and record with us and then drift off again. Once Carolyn Tedford said she, was go she, she loved me, and, I'm, and I'm going to marry, marry, marry her when I grow up. So well, what do you want to do? Do you just want to record? We were working in an office together and we joined the office band and uh, that's how we got to know each other. It's usually OK. Love at first sight? Well, I had a sneaking suspicion that Pete liked me because he was really rude and sarcastic to me all the time, so I thought, oh, I think he's probably quite keen. Um, no, that's not true. And how's married life been over the last seven years? <laughs> <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> if ever I heard one. It's absolute bliss. <laughs> uh, totally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you live with someone for a long time, things change and you adapt, but you get to a point where you don't have to have preamble conversations. You don't have to fall out. It's just not worth spending a long time sulking with each other, is it? Um, true. That's, that's, why I, that's why I don't do it anymore. <laughs> Always blue, every day. Writing's just something I feel compelled to do. You've got a lot more relaxed about playing me new stuff and not getting really annoyed if I say that might need a bit of work. So you used to be careful about criticising him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got better about accepting criticism as well. A little. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a little. <laughs> we met seven years ago. What's happened to the two of you up to now? Three years ago, my mother died. Frank died the same year. In the case of my mother, that was the normal course of events. She was in the late 80s. She, she'd had um, dementia. But, of course, you know, you're never old enough to lose both your parents because then you feel, I'm next in the firing line. <laughs> I have to put my head above that parapet now. And do you have any plans for children? Not at the moment, no. What else would I really feel about it seriously? Our son has moved out into his own home. He's not very far away. Uh, our daughter is doing a master's at uh, Goldsmiths in London. And she's based at home, but she's spending a lot of her time in London. Mm. Most of the stuff you come out of school with is absolutely useless. You just don't need it. I mean, do you think your children will get the opportunities you've had, or do you think life is closing in? Well, I think just at the moment it appears life is maybe closing in a little. I do think the future is not maybe as bright as it would have been for a kid coming out of university like me in the late 70s. They're going to university, they're ending up 
working in call centres, in hospitality. Um, it's getting hellishly difficult for them to get onto the property ladder. I think maybe they're going to be the first generation that don't have it better than their parents. Teachers are undervalued and underrated, and the whole the system is beginning to crumble. You know, people. Have I still get very angry about things. Probably not so much about the things going on in the house, more about things going on in the wider world. When I was seven years old, when all this started, it was effectively illegal to be actively gay. It was illegal to have an abortion. We were still executing people. You could put up a sign saying, no blacks are Irish. And so clearly, we've become a more tolerant and more inclusive and less prejudiced society than we were. I think it's probably a more peaceful world than it was. I would also say that we have a way to go on equal treatments of women. I was a member of the Labour Party for most of my adult life. I'm no longer. Tell me your feelings about Brexit. Without wishing to sound patronising, I don't think a lot of them knew what they were voting for. I think they just saw this as a chance to kick what they perceived as an establishment from which they were excluded. I mean, obviously, I've got to get a job. I don't want to laze around in the dole for months and months. I can go mad. What is your working life at the moment? I still work um, two days a week in the day job, the civil service. I am currently writing a novel midway through the first draft. The hardest thing has been to face down the blank sheet of paper and to actually start. What have been for you the best times? I knew you'd ask me this, because you're, you're going to hope I, I repeat what I said about the 1977 European Cup final. Tommy Smith scoring the second goal in Rome. Definitely. One of the old times. Which game was that? Which game was that? <laughs> and I'm under a strict warning not to repeat that. <laughs> and, <laughs> That was the European Cup final, 1977. So do you think these up series has any value? I think it's more difficult for me and the others to stand back and be wholly objective about that because it's been part of my life as far back as I can remember. Last time you did the show, I wouldn't let you look on social media. <laughs> and I just censored everything, because people yeah. can be really hurtful. Except the good bits. Yeah, I'll let you see <laughs> she, the good bits. She let me see them. <laughs> well, if I can't be an astronaut, I'd like to be um, a bridewell sergeant in the police force, like my dad is. One of the concepts behind this is, show me a child when he's seven and I will show you the man. Do you know that's true? I think as I've got older, probably more inclined to think that there is something to that. I can look at myself and think, yes, there is something of that child still in me. I think on the whole, you are formed, certainly, <laughs> before you're in your teens. What do you want out of life? The satisfaction of knowing that I've left some sort of imprint, rather than just lived out my life. Someday we'll ride that silver way. Are there any regrets you have? I think you have to move on with your life and you learn from things you've done. But that's the tapestry of, of a lifetime. The only serious regret I would ever have is if I came to the end of my life and thought, I wish I'd tried that. And I want to get to the end of my life not with that sort of regret. I want to create something that will live on, and I want my life to have meant something in that sense. Lynn grew up in the East End of London. We've heard that he doesn't scratch the bottom. Why am I using wooden spoon, please, to stir this saucepan? 
Well, in a grammar school, I don't think you'll find many girls that really want to do metal work or woodwork. No. We had a teacher at school that uh, his favourite ploy was um, all you girls want to do He's is walk married. out, yeah. get married, have babies and push a pram down the street with a fag hanging outside your mouth. Mm. At 21, she began a career as a children's librarian, starting off in a mobile library in East London. My stamp drawers? Yes. Yes, I'm not stamp drawers. Sleeping Beauty. Teaching children the beauty of books and watching their faces as books unfold to them is just fantastic. To work with children of that age, you've got to love them. And I love children. Because of cuts in the education budget, the mobile library was shut down. At 42, Lynn was working at Bethnal Green. You can draw better than I can. Good morning. When we went back at 49, she was still there. What about you? Good morning. For the last 30 years, I've banged my head against a brick wall to maintain children's services. But this time around, no one's listening. They say that the work that I do that anybody can do it. There would be no specialist running it. <laughs> I may not have a job. You can speak to me today. Despite the cuts and constant changing of jobs in the library, has it been worth it? Yeah, very much. All these things that I've said over the years are flying through my mind at the moment. Um, but yes, it has been worth it. Mm. And you better cut it, because otherwise I'm going to cry. <laughs> At that library review, I got a job. Two years later, another review. And cutting departments again. That time, I didn't get a job. If I could, I would have um, two girls and two boys. Yes, I would I. I've been married a year and couple of months. Um, you do think, Christ, what have I done? When she was 19, she married Russ. They had two daughters, Sarah and Emma. I'm very much geared to the family unit. I mean, us all, we do things together all the time. At 42, the girls were both doing very well at school. All right, darling. Neither of the girls went to university? No. no. Was that disappointing to you? No. Their choice. We discussed it. They felt that the academic side wasn't for them. Really, really quiet. When Emma was 19, she had a son, Connor. Nine years later, she had Riley. How much did he weigh when he was born? Two pounds and a quarter ounce. As soon as he was born, they took him straight through to the neonatal intensive care unit, and he's absolutely fine. And how's old Connor doing? He's doing great. How does he deal with uh, Riley? He loves Riley to bits, but Riley is just a two-year-old. There's a hunting dog in this one. Sarah and Adam have got married since we last saw you. They've got a little boy called Harry. He's getting on fine. I didn't know I was getting into this. <laughs> Are you all right? Yeah, I think so. This is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> look, look out. Russ is still such a great support for me. And he is still my soulmate. You take care. I love you. After all this time, <laughs> we've flourished together. I had an all-white wedding. All white. We were both in white and my bridesmaid was in white. 37 years. Gone extremely quickly. We've just grown together. We learnt to be friends before we had children. We established a solid foundation from which to work for. Tony, watch it, you. You'll go to bed as well. When she was 35, Lynn was having health problems. They stuck all these tubes up inside me and uh, discovered that I've got these veins up here that shouldn't be there. In your brain? Mm-hmm. And what can they do about it? Not a lot at the moment. Well, it's never going to go away. I've still got this. Same malformation. 
It'll always be there. Obviously, I had it from birth. Oh, it's just problems, Neil. <laughs> just Do you think about dying a lot? No. Doesn't worry me at all. I think my dad taught me that. Uh, he wasn't scared of death at all. And it's the people that are left behind. That take the brunt of someone dying. So how long ago is it since your mother died? Five years. Five years. Mm. And how long before that did you know that she was in serious trouble? We didn't. With we didn't. health. 48 hours notice. Not, even, Not that. even that. Very, very, very sudden. She was minding Riley at the park and she accidentally got in the way of the the swing, hit her on the on the arm. Uh, she had quite a lot of bruising. Uh, this caused a poisoning of her system, but she self-medicated and went uh, to bed because of the pain when she should have been really hydrating herself. So eventually uh, her kidneys shut down. We, we knew none of this was going on. It went on from there, it caused a domino effect. Her organs shut down very rapidly and she tried to go to work the following day. She had a part-time job at the hospital. So when she more or less collapsed at, in the hospital, they admitted her. Couldn't have chosen a better day. No, the hospital had kept telling us that she just needs to be rehydrated. We'll put her on a drip for 48 hours. So we didn't know um, that anything sinister was going on. And was it three hours later, we get the call to say that she collapsed. We need to get back in. It, we trusted what we were being told and we, we left her, you know. I kissed her on the forehead and said to her, we'll be back first thing in the morning. We don't know what she went through in those three hours. So yes, it's not our fault. Of course it's not, but you do hold a lot of guilt. They had all the pieces of the puzzle in front of them, but they didn't put it together. We talk about her every day. She's there, she's in our lives still every day, but I like to focus on the happy, the positive times. You know, our kids need us to carry on and, you know, we've got a life still to live and Mum wouldn't definitely have wanted us to spend it constantly crying over her. No. On a daily basis, it is hard, but I like to think about Mum and, and memories and it's only when you start to then speak to other people about it that then the emotion kind of really kicks in um, and i don't think i realized just how much she was adored by like the wider um community around here in grateful memory of lynn for all that she's done for the children of poplar and tower hamlets over 27 years we are both pleased and very proud to dedicate this new library area to Lynn. Well, that's what she dedicated her life to. 35 years of looking after the children in such a diverse community. Every child she just gave that time and that, that commitment to. Right, the story I've got for you this morning is called The Magic Bicycle. She loved it, um, she, and she was brilliant at it. Yeah. You know, she just had a way with them that they'd just open up to her. The kids that she worked with she became a governor and then chair of governors at the school. Uh, she just loved kids, basically. There's things we all do that, oh, I wish I'd done that different, but you take it on board and you learn from that experience. My family have always come first. So for you, that's... I'm happy with the way my life has gone. <laughs> and what about the other children? Where are they now? What are they doing? I read Observer and the Time. I feel like Bandolin when he's already got and it's already a fight. What does university mean? When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. But if I can't be an astronaut, I think I'll be a coach driver.
In 1964, Granada Television brought together a group of seven-year-olds. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. We have followed their lives every seven years. I don't want to keep still. It's life, you know, don't wait for nobody. They talked about their dreams. If I could have two girls and two boys. Their ambitions. I'd quite like to get into politics. And their fears for the future. Life is what happens while you're waiting for something else. I don't think life is there to be regretted. You've got to make the most of it while you've got it. That's how you become the person you are. It's a picture of how any person, how they change. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. We first met Paul at a children's home in West London, along with Simon. I'm old enough to get to job. Uh, I just walk around and see what I can find. They say, uh, where's your father then? You know, when your mum's out at work, tell your father. And I just tell him I ain't got one. When Paul left the children's home, he moved to Australia. Were you happy at the children's home in England? We didn't mind that, really, because we didn't know what was going on. Because we're a bit young. When I was born, uh, you know, I, an illegitimate child, you know, th that's something that's only whispered about. People, you know, feel strongly about it in those days. But nowadays, you, it's... It's not a serious matter. The serious point is, is whether you stay with somebody or you leave them. My father got remarried. Um, How did you get on with your stepmother? Pretty well, but... Like I said before, I mean, I'm not, I'm not just not close. I'm not really close to my father either. I was going to be a policeman, but I thought how hard it would be to join in. I was going to be a phys ed teacher, but uh, one of the teachers told me that uh, you had to get up into university. As a young man, Paul spent many years in the building trade and then moved on into factory work. I was going to be a film star, but now I'm going to be a, an electrical engineer, which is more to reality, really. By 21, Simon was working in the freezer room of Wall Sausages in London. I know I can't stay at Wall's forever. I mean, it's just not me. I couldn't stay there f for that long. I'd, my mind would go dead. And you never feared you should be doing better jobs than these? Aren't you worth more than this? No. Uh... I haven't really. I, I suppose I just like hard work. I don't know. Not really interested in moving on up the scale. Why? I don't need the hassle of being a charger, manager, or whatever. Tell me, do you have any girlfriends? Well, not many. What do you think about girls? Well, not much. Um, since 21, I've got married, had a couple of kids. No. By 28, he had married Yvonne, and they had five children. What would you like to give your children that you never had? They've got everything then. They've even got what I never had. So, Which is what? A father, isn't it? By 35, they were divorced. All I want out of life is to be happy, and, and when I say happy, I want to be happily married as well. well. What was it that you fell in love with? What is it about him? His helplessness, <sighs> I suppose. It was the motherly instinct in me to pick him up and cuddle him. And he's also very good looking, I think, but he doesn't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> and in the summer, he's got this cute little bum in shorts. <laughs> in their 20s, Paul and Sue sold up, bought an old van, and travelled across Australia. I think it brought us closer together because, you know, we really got to know each other and we relied on each other so much. I'd never been so relaxed in my life. I, I felt a lot more confident in myself. By the time they were 28, Paul and Sue had two children, Katie and Robert. Katie did well at school and went on to university the first person in her entire family ever to do so. 
Robert trained as a car mechanic. He met Stacy when they were teenagers, and they now have five children. By the time he was 42, Simon had married Vianetta. We used to go out when we were younger. We met in the laundrette. <laughs> <laughs> Once a week. <laughs> Once a week in the laundrette. <laughs> Vianetta already had a daughter, Miriam. And she and Simon had a son, Daniel. Obviously, when children come into foster care, family and friends are involved as well, and we have to ensure that the children... By 49, Simon and Vianetta had decided to train as foster parents. Went to boarding school when I was young, and I always felt that that was regimental. It didn't allow for personal care, for loving from the adult carers. So I wanted to do something like that for myself, you know, in my own home. Do you know why Uncle Simon looks younger? Because he's so laid back. <laughs> when we first started fostering, we didn't even realize that you actually got a payment for doing it. Yeah. We just did it because we wanted to help. Because if you know that you're going to get 50 people... About four years ago, we were told that we looked after 130-odd kids. And you're ready. You might as well go for it. It's a very hard thing, but it's also magnificently easy when it goes well. I've still got five children. They haven't really taken the breakup of my first marriage too well. I've got still to get to grips with that and get to them and make them understand that daddy is still daddy. Last year, Simon invited his entire family to celebrate Vianetta's birthday. <laughs> They're all together now. They've come round and they've seen that daddy's still dad, whatever's happened. Time is the healer, isn't it? You rush and push and pull. You might be able to do that with a parcel, but you can't do that with a person. It made me feel 110%, everybody together and everybody here for me. It was, it was, it was nice. Yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> it was nice. So what's happened in the last uh, seven years since we were here? Grandchildren, lots of them. So how many have you got now? Got 10 now. It's lovely. Mm. It just tires me out. I haven't got the energy all the time. <laughs> Run! Run! What's happened in the family in the last seven years? So we're another grandchild. Oh, you're coupled. Brody. How is so there's six. Talk nicely to him. Hey, Benny. Benny. Katie's school teacher. Says that a man in a life now. Very nice chap. Which we're pleased about. Hopefully more grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. Look at they do look very happy and all that, mud, don't they, Shane? The fact we've been married for 40 years is just really a fluke, really, is it? You know, like, we might have... No, but what I mean is we've tried hard, <laughs> and that's part of the success, but you, you don't know when you're going to get married that it, it's going to succeed Sorry. and go for 40 years. You, don't, you have no idea. See Windsor Castle from that house. Oh, yeah. We don't actually see each other, touch each other. Over the years, Paul and Sue have met up with Simon and Vianetta when visiting family in England. <laughs> Come on, let me get you organised. But now, for the first time, Simon and Vianetta have come to Australia. Hello. We got on really well when we, we visited them in England. I think Simon and Paul are very similar. Simon's a very creative, sort of artistic a beautiful person to be around. And Vianetta, oh, her and I are just two peas out of the same pod. <laughs> I just think it's a wonderful thing to be able to invite them and they be able to come out here, because it's not like it's just across the road. It's a, it's a big trip, and they're going to share Christmas with us and our family. Would your life have been totally different if you'd had the chance Paul had to come to Australia? For me then, it'd probably been better. To actually try and figure it out now, would it have been better? I wouldn't want to say, because your life is as it is and not as it could be. Yeah. I don't like the big boys hitting us and a prefix sending us out 
At 21, when Paul was in London, we decided to take him and Simon back to the children's home. Why were you there? I believe it was a divorce custody dispute. Most children at that age, if they were taken away from their parents, they wouldn't be overly happy. No. Did you get to see much of your parents? Oh, I kind of only vaguely remember my dad coming to visit every now and then. I was there for about six years. And the only thing I really, really missed was my mum. She was everything to me, and she wasn't there. Remember the tiles? She couldn't cope with the situation of having to look for me, and she didn't have a place of her own at the time. Remember Midgley? He was a real bastard. You felt that you were kept in order all the time. Kids did get the cane if they were caught doing anything wrong. So did you get caned? Not that I can remember. I was a very, very good boy. <laughs> he was the tailor. I remember him. I didn't get a lot of cuddles. And it affects you the way you treat your kids in as much as you try to do it more, but you probably don't do it as much as some other people do. I wanted to love my children, but I used to try to give them discipline instead. Instead of just giving them the little hugs and stuff they needed, that I knew they needed because I needed it. That's what the headmaster's son used to shoot the squirrels off the tree. I definitely felt insecure. I can still remember that. I, I didn't feel insecure when I was being told, be here, be there, do this, do that. Yeah. Where I felt insecure was outside of all of that. You can't believe after so many years that things have really not changed all that much, you know? Paul took Simon to the children's home where he lived when he first arrived in Australia. The track's about the same. So how old were you when you first came here? It was somewhere between seven and eight years of age, right. I'd say. We, we pretty much land in Australia. It wasn't all that long before my father arranged for us to come up here and live. And how was it to be here? The best childhood memories I've got of, is of being up here. Why did he take you home to live with the family? Well, I think he, Dad was a coat and dress designer, and they were also trying to set a house up, and that's just the way that they chose to do it. See the views over My dad, despite my, what other members of the family might think, he was a good man. He was a kind man. He was strict, but he was kind. <laughs> you know, I was always frightened of everything as a young child, and I think it, you know, slowly but surely, it just slowly brought me out of myself. Like Paul, I was very shy when I was young, and I think this place would give you the confidence to do things for yourself. I think my main weakness is I don't really take a grip of life. I know if I ever wanted to get on, I could do it. I think what it is really, I'm just waiting for an excuse to use it. This one just there. Yeah, yeah. Both the wives say that you both lack confidence. The lack of confidence, you sort of second guess yourself or question yourself all the time. Yeah. It's just like just now, I noticed we both looked at each other because we both knew exactly what we were going to say, but we waited. Yeah. <laughs> we waited for the other one to say it. Yeah. What's been the saddest, toughest time for you in your life so far? Well, I think early, early years going away from the home and going to the boarding school and, and living away from home here as well. Who's granddad? Hey! My father died approximately four years ago. That was very sad. He was the one constant in my life. Sorry. Even though I knew my mum wasn't well at all, and she was probably dying, I still felt she'd be there forever. When she actually died, there were so many things that I never asked. Why did you not marry Dad or stay with him? So there were so many things that were left unsaid. Say you had a wife, they, they say you had to eat what they cooked you, and and say 
I don't like greens, well, I don't. One of the fundamental premises of this series of films is you can see the man in a seven-year-old child. Basically, what you see is seven-year-old shy, not very confident, worried about everything. I, that's what I was like then, and, and to a great degree, still like that. I'm not making light of what I have achieved, but I, I wasn't going to make any wonderful achievements. I think that was pretty obvious. I was going to be just a worker. Hi, right, Paul. How are you? Everybody, Tucker's ready. Anyone for some food? Do you have any regrets? There's just no place for regrets in this world. But, I mean, I've been lucky. <laughs> Meeting Susan, I've been with her longer than I was with my dad. And she's been an unbelievable influence on my life. Getting me to see the positive side of things rather than the negative. Maybe one regret is probably would have liked more children. I feel OK just getting on with life, just sort of keeping up. But uh, I know if I really wanted to, I could get on. The sooner you understand who you are, the sooner you understand what you can do. It's taken me virtually 60 years to understand who I am. John went to Westminster, then on to read law at Christ Church, Oxford. I do believe parents have a right to educate their children as they think fit. I think someone who works on the assembly line in some of these car factories and earning a huge wage could well afford to send their children to, to private school if they wanted to. At 21, we asked him what career he would pursue. Might be at the bar. Doing what? Perhaps chancery practice. I now have a career. I'm a barrister. Um, other than that, life chugs along in varying degrees. Well, in a sense, not very much has changed in my career over the, the last 14 years. I'm still a barrister. I still wear a curly white wig. Um, the only visible difference, I suppose, is I wear a silk gown because I'm now a QC. What's changed in your life since we last talked? Seven years older, seven years fatter, a bit less hair. <laughs> I mean, nothing much, really. I mean, on a, on a more serious level. I mean, I'm still a barrister, a QC. When boys go around with girls, they don't pay attention to what they're doing. Yes, it's my girl, grandmother had an accident because a, a boyfriend was kissing her girl, his girlfriend in the street. By 35, John had married Claire the daughter of a former ambassador to Bulgaria. It is coincidental that we met, but it's obvious that the Balkan uh, connection was a strong mutual interest. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of Friends of Bulgaria. My mother, in fact, is from Bulgaria, and that explains why, for me, Bulgaria is an especially important place. The hands are over there, I think. I think the more you've had out of the country, the, the, the more privileges you're, you're born with, the, the greater your duty is. I still feel, as I did when I was 21, that it's important for people who have had advantages to try and put as much back and to help others less fortunate than themselves if they can. Recently, I think this charity, Friends of Bulgaria, is something that's very important in my life. When we first came, the country really was on its knees. I remember we were taking basic things like anaesthetics round to hospitals and blood supplies, and all of that's changed. Bulgaria's been in the EU now since, um, I think, about 2006, and it's slowly catching up. We're in Velika Ternovo, which is the medieval capital of Bulgaria, and Friends of Bulgaria, the charity of which I'm now chairman, we have various projects, and we're here to see how those projects are going along. 
This plaque here commemorates my great-grandfather who's sitting in the front row. By then, he'd already been a leader of the revolution against the Turks in Plovdiv, and actually, he'd been condemned to death because he was captured. He also did an awful lot for charity. I'm sure he keeps me up to my mark. I do feel I'd like to continue the tradition of doing good things to help people here. Even if I don't quite have his means, personally, it's on a more modest scale. I feel I could go on forever, but the trouble is many of my solicitor clients are themselves retiring, and you know, the worry is what will end up with no clients. So no clients, no cases. So as I understand it, we're going to meet three of the children. So who what would you do when it comes time to retire? I won't be bored. I love travel. We're still riding, still enjoying the English countryside. I did have a terrible fall from a horse uh, about two years ago, and so that was dicing with death. I had a, a brain hemorrhage, and um, that was definitely unfunny. I can still play the piano a bit. I'm not as good as I used to be. Nonsense little theme. Butter wouldn't melt in its mouth. Whether it's old age and arthritis or whether it's falling off horses too many times, I don't know. But I mean, I don't feel I've got quite the, the dexterity in my fingers. Certainly, I can never tell the difference between you playing and the CD playing when I'm out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. very good. Well, she's very diplomatic. No, no, it's true. <laughs> Are you ambitious? Yes. What for? Well, fame. And power. What sort of power? Political power. I'd quite like to go into politics, but I mean, that's uh, uh, easier said than done. I don't know why I felt like that, but I did. And maybe it's because all the Bulgarian ancestors were all prime ministers and things like that. But I mean, the truth is, I've been a big disappointment to myself because um, I've decided not to throw my hat into the ring for politics. And I don't have any regrets, if the truth be told. How do you think England will change over the next few years? Not very much. England is too English, as you tell me. People who've had things going well for them really ought to stay and sort of help the country out when, it, when it's, you know, things aren't going very well. I don't believe in all this pulling one's money out. Where do you stand on Brexit? I don't mind saying I voted Remain. I can't say I'm a, a fantastically enthusiastic European wearing my English hat. But on the other hand, I thought it was a leap into the dark that we didn't need to take. I blame quite a few politicians. I suppose I blame David Cameron because I think the decision to hold the referendum was mistaken. It's much too complicated a question to submit to a simple yes or no answer. I think it's not a bad idea to pay for schools, because if we didn't, schools would be so nasty and crowded. The world now is very different from when it was when we were seven. I think there were inequalities in British society at that stage, which I must say I don't see anymore. Something I did slightly object to in the programmes, we were shown at the age of seven, outlining sort of the academic sort of career that most of us you know, will, did in fact pursue, you know, it was presented as if it was just, you know, part of some indestructible birthright that we went to all, all this place. And I thought that was un unfair. It didn't show us sort of having to do beastly jobs in the holidays. If you're talking about people from my background, I think life is probably more difficult for them because there's more competition. So many more people go to university. No one cares at all what background people go to. People recruit to get the best people for the job they have to offer. It's Sean McInnes, you got three minuses in a day. You need a pest. It has to be said that I bitterly regret that the headmaster of the school where I was when I was seven pushed me forward for this series, because every seven years, a little pill of poison is injected into... Um, I know. Well, that's, that's, well, that's the truth. I'm much more down to earth as a person than I might have ended up when I was seven. And that was probably because, you know, I did a year and more in the army before going up to Oxford. And, the, you know, there, there were various things that introduced me to the real world, whereas 
I could have been stuck in an ivory tower. What viewers were never told is that my father died when I was age nine, um, leaving my mother in very uncomfortable financial circumstances. She had to go out to work to see us through school, and that and I got a scholarship to Oxford. You know, I don't regard myself as particularly typical of the type that I was no doubt selected to represent. I mean, apart from anything else, I'm three quarters foreign, which is an odd beginning for what one of the papers described after 21 as the archetypal Tory square. What's the most important thing in your life? My wife, my family and friends, my homes. If I'm allowed a fourth, I'd say my animals. <laughs> How do you think you've changed since you were seven? Well, I mean, one grows so slowly that one never notices. Any regrets about decisions you've made in your life? No, I can't say that. But it, it's not really my character. I always try and make the best of everything, even if it's not the best situation you're in. Scotland, and he's, I think he's 13. Have you got any boyfriends, Susan? What is your attitude towards marriage? Well, I don't know. I, mean, I haven't given it a lot of thought, because I'm very, very cynical about it. Obviously, any child going through their parents splitting up age 14 or at a very vulnerable age, I mean, it does cut you up, but... There was no point in them staying together for me because it was worse. I mean, the rise and, and it's it's worse. When I last saw you at 21, you were nervous, you were chain smoking, you were uptight, and now you seem happy. What's happened to you over these last seven years? I suppose Rupert. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you some credit. <laughs> okay. I'm not chain smoking. <laughs> I'm not very children minded at the moment. I don't know if I ever will be. What do you think about them? Well, I don't like babies. <laughs> what was the biggest shocks to you when you suddenly were confronted with a, a small baby? The panic set in, I think, um, that I wasn't going to be able to cope. We were lucky. We had a very good family unit with, the, with them growing up. And that meant an awful lot to me that I was able to do that for them, because I never had it for myself. What do you think about making this program? I just think it's just ridiculous. I don't see any point in doing it. There's a lot of baggage that gets stirred up every seven years for me that I find quite... that I find very hard to, to deal with. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I was quite adamant I wasn't going to do it. And then... I don't know. I suppose I have this ridiculous sense of loyalty to it, Hello. even though I hate it. Hello. Um, yeah. Susie decided not to take part in 63 Up. When I grow up, I want to be an astronaut. But if I can't be an astronaut, I think I'll be a coach driver. This is probably linked up with the fact now that I want to travel. I mean. My thoughts haven't really changed differently. You know, so I definitely wouldn't like to be a coach driver now. Watch this. Neil grew up in a Liverpool suburb with his friend Peter and had oh, dreams please. of going to Oxford, but didn't get in. Instead, he went to Aberdeen University, but dropped out after the first term. At 21, Neil was working on a building site and living in a squat. I would like to be somebody in a position of importance, and I've always all this. Um, but I don't think I'd, I'm, I'm the right sort of person to carry the responsibility for whatever it is. I always thought, well, I'd love to be, <laughs> possibly even love to be in politics or something like this. At 28, we found Neil homeless, wandering around the west coast of Scotland. If the money runs out, well, then for a few days, there's nowhere to go to. And that's just, that's all you can do. I simply have to find the, 
the warmest shed I can find. At 35, he was living in a council estate on the most northerly part of Britain, the Shetland Islands. And what would you like to be doing, say, in seven years? I can think of all kinds of things I'd like to be doing. The real question is, what, what, am, I, what am I likely to be doing? What are you likely to be doing? <laughs> and that's a horrible question. Um, I tend to think the most likely answer is that I'll be wandering homeless around the streets of London. Well, i just point out some of the considerable disadvantages. Um, first of all, they are geographically... At 42, Neil had moved to London and was a Liberal Democrat on Hackney Council. While I was in Shetland, I felt very strongly that I should become involved in politics, simply because I felt I was not achieving anything in the ways I really, I really wanted to. By 49, Neil had left London, moved to Cumbria in the northwest of England, and was a Liberal Democrat member of his local district council. Neil Hughes is the Liberal Democrat candidate. I and the Liberal Democrats want to see a just and fair society in which everyone... In 2006, I was invited to go to Australia to give a talk. And the, the chap who introduced me said, Neil is clearly such a profoundly motivated politician that we can all expect to see him as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Now, this wasn't a joke. I assure you, he said this was absolute serious. Now, it was ludicrous, but... This is how wildly skewed the perceptions have become. I mean, do you think I would really have been invited to Australia if they were aware that I was someone who lives on a few quid a week benefit and has as much chance of changing the future of the United Kingdom as someone who's serving a lifetime jail sentence? I'm not for an instant under the impression that politics was always completely moral and so obviously uh, there have always been issues. But it's very sad that so few people now feel that politics has any answers for them. They don't see anything in any of the political um, affiliations. But those who protest outside abortion clinics, if they do so peacefully, are actually protesting... As long as I can still remember what I'm going to say when I stand up in council, which isn't guaranteed, then I'll, I'll keep doing it for a bit. Um, so you, you Where do you stand on Brexit? Now? It's quite an unbelievable occurrence. It's as if you are asking everybody in Britain to take poison and say this they thought was for their good health. So cheers. The vote wasn't a vote to leave the European Union. It was a vote against all politicians or whatever parties and against the deteriorating society we live in. I don't think um, I was really taught any sort of policy of living at all by my parents. This, this is probably their biggest mistake. That I was just left to fend for myself in a world which they seem completely oblivious of. I mean, what's your feeling towards your parents, both of whom I know passed away? It's not resentment. Uh, they did their very best. I don't say this cruelly. The problem was in their own personalities, which caused me unending difficulty. My father, very serious, very secretive. He could be very harsh in the punishments he gave out. My mother, completely different, compl utterly superficial. A genuine lover of the arts, but as much of a dilettante as you could possibly imagine. So she knew a little about everything, but not a great deal about, about very much. And did you ever have it out with your father? Oh, many arguments, yeah. More often than not, my father would just sit in silence and my mother would talk, but it was mostly to herself. When I get married, I don't want to have any children because they are always doing naughty things and making the whole house untidy. Children inherit something from their parents. And even if my wife were the most um, high-spirited and ordinary and normal of people, um, the child would still stand a very fair chance of being not totally uh, full of happiness because of what he or she will have inherited from me. What's happened in your life in the last seven years? Oh, that, that takes us back to uh, when I met my current wife. Um, and, um, uh, and for four or more years of happy marriage and then 
uh, an unfortunate series of occurrences, I suppose, which means we don't see each other very often now. How did you two meet? Well, I was performing in the village pantomime, and she came along and watched it. We courted in the same way that any two 20-year-olds would court. We walked along the, 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 the River Tees at Stockton. There was a lovely restaurant down there that um, we used to eat in. But we did a lot of lovely things together. I don't for a minute regret that partnership. I'm just sorry that for reasons I will never fully understand, it's, it, 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 it's got to where it is. My tendency to get in low moods was not helpful to her. I quite understand that, although she was well aware of that when we got married. I made some very strenuous attempts to reconcile us. We met a couple of times this year, and I was hoping that things might improve, but they don't seem to have done. Right. But as far, as far as I'm concerned, there's time for her to, to reconsider. Mm. Whether that'll happen, I don't know. Do you worry about your sanity? Other people sometimes worry about it. Like who? Like sometimes can be found behaving in, 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 in an erratic fashion. Um, I sometimes get very frustrated, very angry. Are you having any medical treatment for your mood changes? Your... No, I haven't for many years. Because I wouldn't like to be dependent upon man-made substances for the cure. Do you ever think you're going mad? Oh, I don't think it. I, I know it. Uh, I, uh... Well, because we... We're not allowed to use the word mad. But, um... You know, uh, it, it, I, think, I think most people are mad here, really. It's incredibly difficult to talk about. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to confess that they suffer spells of um, mental ill health. Sometimes if I'm feeling particularly depressed, uh, particularly, there are some situations in which I do want somebody to speak to me, but there are many situations in which I want to be left alone until I'm feeling better. And I think that this is perhaps the point that my wife found it particularly hard to determine. Because I did say to her, say something to me if you can see I'm depressed, but don't keep on saying it. Just leave me alone after that. In the winter, if you lived in the country, well, it was just all wet and there wouldn't be anything for miles around. And you get, so and you get soaked if you tried to go out and there's no shelter anywhere. I don't see any way out. I thought of everything I possibly could. It seemed to me for a long time that getting a, a, a reliable job and a, a nice place to live would be the solution. Well, I haven't succeeded. Um, I can't see any immediate future at all. Neil still lives in Cumbria, but he's bought a house in France. So how long have you had the house? Two and a half years. My wife found it on a website for properties. She persuaded me that it was the one that would suit me the best. <laughs> and how did this come about? After my mother died, there was a, a legacy divided between my brother and I, and some of it was able to be put towards this house. So tell me what this place means to you. It's, it's just a lovely, quiet, place in the country. I've lived much of my life in rural places in the past. I think rural places have a lot of shared values wherever you go. People tend to look after one another better. Communication is easier and you'll get good local food and country activities. So I, think. I do miss the towns and the cities sometimes as well. I miss London where I lived. I think if you're healthy and have good friends, you can get on perfectly well. But everybody would like to be rich. If the state didn't give us any money, it would probably just mean crime. And I'm glad I don't have to, to steal to keep myself alive. How do you manage for money these days? I'm lucky in that what I earn from being a county councillor is sufficient for my standard of living. Bonjour. Bonjour. Um, je voudrais, s'il vous plaît, acheter quelques pommes de terre et quelques pommes. So since I've been doing that, I haven't needed to claim any state benefits. And it, what a great relief it was not to have to do that. So are you frightened of getting old? I do have concerns. 
I've always relied on my body very much. I've always, whatever else has been going on, I've generally been in excellent physical health. I never really seriously believed when I was a teenager that I'd be a pensioner, because it just seemed so implausible, despite the fact everybody who gets the chance does grow old. I regret that having reached the age I'm at, I've had no success in the sphere I really want to be successful in. Being a writer, by instinct, is very much about interaction with the rest of society, which in my case just hasn't happened. It simply hasn't happened. Yes, I'd say I believed in God. Are you religious? Well, I go to church with my parents on Sundays. Oh, I don't know even now whether I do believe in God or not. I've thought an awful lot about it, actually, and uh, I still don't know. And how's he been treating you? <laughs> well, I said to somebody uh, last week, that I preferred the Old Testament to the New Testament, because in the Old Testament, God is very unpredictable. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, how I, I've seen him in, in my life. If you haven't already been told, the proposed pet show is unfortunately canceled. I'm a lay minister. Uh, I'm licensed to carry out quite a number of functions. It includes leading services, preaching, taking part in the readings, helping to distribute the communion and so on. In fact, I can do more or less everything a priest can do. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you still doing that work? I've just recently been relicensed as a reader in the Church of England. The title reader is really that of lay preacher. I wake up every day and I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I will be in a month's time, six months' time, a year's time. But my Christian faith helps me. It's made a great deal of difference to my life. I would say I've clearly um, experienced beneficial effects, but that's what not, not what religion is about. Everybody hopes they do get beneficial results from it, but really it's more about having a relationship with, with God. And in, in Christianity, that's through Jesus Christ and his teaching. Every time this program starts, it says, give me a child until you're mm. seven, and I will give you the man. Mm. Is that true or false? You're probably in a, You and the audience are probably in a better position. On the, on the evidence that, that, that has been presented. We don't do much fighting in school because, because we think it's horrible and it hurts. You get to know different types of people, people with different sort of brains, you know, from the very sort of very clever people to the, you know, people who haven't got much sense at all, really. I wonder why I was like that. I wonder what it was inside me that made me like that. And I can see even at 14 that I was beginning to get more subdued and I was putting a lot more thought into what I was saying, to a ridiculous degree. I mean, you're the classic example of it not being true. At 7 and 14, mm. everybody was in love with you. Yeah. You uh, and now nobody speaks to me. Well, sure they do, but, you know, your own life went into a kind of free fall somewhat. I don't know what sort of stumbling blocks should be put in, in a child's way to get him used to living in the outside world. Because I, I think maybe this is, this is something that, that was wrong in my upbringing. I didn't have enough obstacles to get over, to, to toughen myself up against. The change of you at 14 mm -hmm. to the change of you at 21... Yeah. ..on the building site was staggering. How can you explain that vast change in... I, I thought differently. I had different aspirations. I wasn't content with a, a quiet, domesticized life. I had to go out and, and seek adventure. And it had its downside because I hadn't really been well prepared for it in, in my childhood. What's the happiest time you've had? I, I'm just happy when something goes right and it can be something very straightforward. If I can get something done for somebody through my council work, then I'm genuinely happy. And in my church work, if I think I'm genuinely communicating something to people about God, then that delights me inside. It's really Philip. 
Before I ever met my wife, I did have a very serious relationship with an Australian girl with whom I can say truly the only person I was ever really deeply in love with. And I think she was, she felt similarly towards me. And she said to me then, she said, this is an impossible situation, not because of what we feel for each other, but because we live so far apart. The idea of true love, which I do think exists, occurs so seldom. You know, it occurs once in, every, in somebody's life, they're extremely lucky. For it then to happen, and then the potential can't be fulfilled, is heartbreaking. At the end of their very special day in London, after their trip to the zoo and the party, we took our children to an adventure playground where they could do just what they liked. Those from the children's home set about building a house. There's Nicholas. Andrew, John, and Bruce. Jackie and her friends. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will give you the man. This has been a glimpse of Britain's future.